Or we can open to the book of Nahum this morning. It's right in the middle of the Minor Prophets. A little short book, just three chapters. It's also one we don't go to very much. We'll start in chapter 1. Uh, Lord willing, we'll look at the first six verses. Uh, there's a glare on the clock this morning, so I can't tell what time it is. <laughs> That's probably just my glasses. I need new ones. But Nahum, chapter 1. But Nahum is an interesting book. There's no other mention of the prophet Nahum anywhere in the scriptures. It says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. There's also no other mention of Elkish or the Elkishites anywhere in scripture. But Nahum's main topic is the destruction of Nineveh, really the fall of the Assyrian Empire. Mm -hmm. It's believed, and I would probably agree that it was written sometime after the book of Jonah, that most likely the Ninevites had repented of Jonah's preaching, but at some point along the way they had backslid and they fell back into their idolatry and wickedness. Right. And Nahum's prophecy, his burden as he calls it here, is primarily to pronounce judgment upon them. Mm -hmm. So he goes pretty in detail about this judgment that would come upon them in his three chapters, but he begins here with really kind of a call to how God is great and how God is mighty and powerful before he pronounces it judgment upon them. Verse 2 he says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Amen. Now, he says God is jealous. That is not a sinful jealousy like man often gets. Right. Man's jealousy is often rooted in envy. But God's jealousy is a righteous jealousy. It's really God is desires and also deserving of our complete affection, praise, glory, and honor. Mm -hmm. We'll turn back to Exodus for a moment. Exodus chapter 20, uh, familiar scriptures here, but here he calls himself a jealous God. Mm -hmm. Exodus 20 and verse 3, he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children from the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Amen. He says he is a jealous God. He is not pleased when his people fall to idolatry. Right. I know we don't set up you know, idols of wood and stone and gold and things like that, but... We have idols in America today. Sure. <laughs> They're usually things like money, possessions, and yeah. jobs, and even family sometimes. But God is not pleased when we divert what belongs to Him unto these other things. In fact, Isaiah 42, verse 8 says that He is the Lord, and there is none like Him, and He will not give His glory to another. Right. So God does not share His glory with anybody. Amen. Although Romans had the idea that there's multiple gods and you know, Zeus is kind of the head god, that's not how our God works. Amen. The God of the Bible, He is the God, the only God. Right. As He says, He is jealous. He does not take any pleasure when we don't give Him the praise and the honor and the glory that He deserves. So he desires of it, he's deserving of it, and he is worthy of it. So my assumption here is that the Ninevites, <clears throat> here they had 
fallen back into some form of idolatry. Maybe back to their old gods, which they had before. Perhaps back to the same thing that they were doing before Jonah came and preached to them. Right. But he goes on to say, And the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. Now this revenge means to avenge or take vengeance. You know, today there's a, a push that God's just all love and peace and you know, right. rainbow and unicorns, so to speak. Mm -hmm. God is also a God of vengeance. Amen. Romans 12, 19, Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, where it says, Vengeance of mine, I will pay, saith the Lord. That's it. The, the God, especially as revealed in the Old Testament, was very much a God of vengeance. David oftentimes cried out to be avenged of his adversaries. But I thought it was interesting here that he says, The Lord revengeth. And he goes on to say, the Lord revengeth and is furious. And then a third time he says, the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. You know, we should pay attention when God says it once. So, right. Yeah. When he says it twice, we should pay attention. But when he says it three times in the same verse, we really ought to pay attention. You're right. So God is merciful. He is gracious, as we'll see. He, but yet, he will take vengeance. He will repay that which is owed. God doesn't just gloss over sin. But even here it says he was furious. He was mad, if you will. But again, not an anger that was tainted by sin like we often have. But he was righteously furious with these people here. For they were supposed to be serving him and they were serving other gods. They were involved in wickedness. Amen. Well, he is not pleased when his people are involved in sin. Let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 4 for this moment. Jeremiah 4 and verse 4. He, he writes here to the people of Judah and Jerusalem and says, and Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart, you men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn, and that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Mm -hmm. so they were physically circumcised, but in heart they weren't. Right. right. Amen. He says, Take away the foreskin of your hearts, you men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn, and that none can quench it. When the Lord pours out his wrath, if you will, upon him, something that man cannot hold it back. We see that very plainly with Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. The Lord was done with that place and he literally rang down fire and brimstone upon him. But when God's done with the place, he'll destroy it. He'll take right. care of it. That's why I've often has said that when the Lord gets done with this country that we live in, it'll be done with. That's it. Amen. Yeah. A thousand Donald Trumps won't be able to save it. You got it. Uh -huh. you know, even I consider in the ministry of Christ, he got righteously mad, didn't he? Mm -hmm. When he went to the temple in Matthew 21, they were selling doves and other things. He Overturn the tables, ran them out. Right. So there really is a time in which we can be angry and be right. But in fact, I think Paul says in one place, be angry and sin not. Mm -hmm. To see sin accepted and even promoted by God's people should make us angry. That doesn't mean we need to go in there and start get our cattle out and chase the people out of the church building, but I don't think you can use Matthew 21 as a, to support that type of teaching, but you, we should be 
upset, if you will, over sin. Mm -hmm. Certainly our God is furious, as he says here, over sin. He doesn't take any pleasure. He is not satisfied, if you will, with his people living in wickedness. Let's go on to the next verse back in our text, though. He said that he vengeance and his furious, he will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. In fact, let, well, he will come with vengeance one day, won't he? Amen. I know, even in this life, I've seen vengeance come upon people that have wronged people of God. Just, God doesn't take lightly to those who do his church and his people wrongly. But one day vengeance will come out with full force, if you will. Second Thessalonians chapter one. So as Christians, it's not our job to get even. It's not our job to pay people back for their wrongdoings. That's the world's teaching, but our God will pay him back in time. Amen. It's that I've seen it happen in this life, but it will ultimately happen in eternity. Second Thessalonians one verses seven through nine say well, let's wait for the right book. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. There's that verse we talked about a couple weeks ago. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Amen. Just one day Christ will come and take vengeance on all this world. Very well. They'll, they'll all be destroyed in just a moment. Amen. That's why we can rest. We don't have to worry about it. It's, you know, God or the devil get a win in the end. God will win. He will have the ultimate vengeance. You're right. But that kind of leads us into the our next verse here. Just because we don't see things happen right away doesn't mean that God will not ultimately get the revenge, if you will. You know, we think that it needs to be instantaneous, doesn't it? Lord, he, he did me wrong. Aren't you going to do something about it? And Lord, they're mistreating us. Can't you do something? What does verse 3 say? The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Amen. So really, we got to give God much thanks that he's slow to anger. You're right. He would still be a just God if he just wiped us out anytime we did wrong. Mm -hmm. All the way back to Adam and Eve when they sinned, he could have wiped them out. He was about ready to just take out Israel there in the wilderness, wasn't he? Remember he told Moses, I'm going yeah. to destroy them and I'll raise up the people and to you. No, he slowed anger. He lashed out like we ought to do. But the saying goes, God doesn't just fly off the handle. Mm -hmm. If he did, we'd be hurting, wouldn't we? He's slow to anger. Let's go over to Psalms 103. Psalms 103, verse 8. <clears throat> really, this slow to anger also means long suffering. We see those two thoughts brought out all throughout the scriptures. Psalms 103, verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Amen. Verse 9 says, He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10 says, He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor reward us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions Amen. from us. Amen. He is not only long suffering or slow to anger, as it's called here, but he's also merciful and gracious. You know, many people want justice today, it seems like. Mm. But you don't want the justice of God. You got it. 
So what you want with God is this mercy and this grace. That's Amen. it. We'll get to that in a moment, but really his justice demands payment for sin. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God, though, that he says here he had not dealt with us after our sin, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Well, he's removing them as far as the east is from the west. So what Nineveh here, they would be dealt with after their sins and after their iniquities. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be a fun ride, if you will. You can go and read the rest of the book this week and you can see they had some pretty harsh judgment coming upon them. Amen. So can we really expect anything less if we go after wickedness? We fall after idols. Mm. You know, uh, First John, he ends the book with this thought. My little children, keep yourself from idols. That's it. So it must be that he thought the people there were prone to fall after idols if he had warned them against it. Right. We in our flesh certainly are prone to fall after idols. He said, I know they're not idols of gold and silver and or wood that we've carved out, but we very easily can follow after other things that are made into an idol. Amen. Let's go back to our text here. After it says that he's slow to anger, it says that he is great in power. Now we could probably spend the whole lesson just talking about how God is great in power. Amen. What about four weeks ago now? I guess it was when I just talk about his great power in creation. See that? We see his power throughout the Bible, throughout the scriptures. We see examples of his great power displayed. Let's turn back to Jeremiah for a moment. We're talking about creation. Jeremiah references that. Jeremiah chapter 32. Really, it's in several places, but Look at two of them real quick. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Here he says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. And by his great power, he says, he made heaven and earth. There's nothing too hard for him. It's not... Well, I've done some pretty hard stuff in my life. But for God, there's nothing that's too hard. He's, mm -hmm. Saving someone is not too hard. Saving the most wicked of men is not too hard for him. Amen. If Saul of Tarsus doesn't show that, then I don't know what else does. <laughs> Providing when we have needs, that's not too hard for him. I've seen that in my own life. Yet we act as if Sometimes God will struggle with something, don't we? But if he who has the great power to make heaven and earth just by speaking, then there is certainly nothing too hard for him. Amen. Turn back a couple chapters to 27. Jeremiah 27, verse 5. Here the Lord is speaking. And it says, I have made the earth the man and the beasts that are upon the ground, by my great power and my outstretched arm, and have given unto whom it seemed meet unto me. Amen. Here God himself declares, just by his great power, he made the earth and really everything that's in it. He says he done with it whatsoever he pleased. He said, how it seemed meet unto me. God does with his creation what he wants and how he wants and when he wants. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar saw that. That's another example of a, a great power. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar was a great and mighty king. He had one of the largest empires of the ancient world. So if it was likened to anything now, it would be likened in America, how great and powerful and mighty of influence his empire was. And yet God brought him down as an animal. That's it. He ate the grass, he slept outside, the dew was upon him, he had with feathers on him. Mm -hmm. Really, he was, they called him mad and crazy. Yeah. 
people who came back to his senses, though he knew who the Lord was. Amen. Pharaoh is another example of his great power. He even says they raised him up by his own power. He might show his power in me. Amen. He raised up Pharaoh. He hardened his heart. He then he worked on his heart to let people of Israel go and hardened his heart to follow after them and destroyed him in the Red Sea. Pharaoh and all his army. Once again, we see the power of God in this thing. We won't belabor at that point because we can spend the rest of the day on it probably. But back in our text in Nahum 5, 1 verse 3, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great power and will not at all equip the wicked. Well, this seems like a problem, doesn't it, for us? Because we are all wicked by nature. But God does not gloss over sin, if you will. This literally means that it will not go unpunished. Mm-hmm. No, this is the justice of God, that he will not acquit the wicked, that his justice demands punishment for sin. But praise be to God that for us that are born again, that was placed upon Christ. Amen. So, it says over in Romans chapter 4, let's turn there, I can't quite quote it. So man just kind of wants God to look at our sin, to think that to look at man as guiltless, but man is guilty before God. Amen. Man is really guilty of more than he wants to admit before God. Mm-hmm. Notice what he says in Romans 4, here, verses 6 through 8. Paul had been describing how Abraham was righteous through faith. And he goes on to use David now as an example. He says, Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. The our sinfulness, our wickedness, our guilt was all placed upon Christ. And his righteousness was placed upon us. If you remember back to our class and the sacrifices, this, the sin offering took away the actual sin and the trespass offering took away the guilt of the sin. Amen. And in Christ, all that was fulfilled. All that was complete. Mm-hmm. So he will not acquit us in the sense that he will just say, oh yeah, you're innocent. You're guiltless. But no, he did take all that and place it upon Christ for us. Right. That word impute really comes from finances, which be placed on the account of someone. Our sins and wickedness were placed on Christ's account, and his righteousness was imputed to our account. Mm-hmm. If not for that, we would all be guilty before we go. Amen. He will not at all acquit the wicked, he says here. He will not. Just look over sin as many today think that he will. Let's go back to our text. Let me get back to it. Um, no, it seems that many today want a God who will not judge according to sin. Mm-hmm. They want a God who will just accept them for who they are. But who they really are is a wicked sinner, isn't it? Amen. A vile wretch. And that's not politically correct to say today, but that is the truth of the matter. Amen. You're right. No, God will not acquit the wicked. He says, he will not at all acquit the wicked. He adds that little phrase in there. Not that he will sometimes acquit them, sometimes he won't. Maybe let you off on a few sins, but no, not at all, he says. It's a, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, in the storm, and the clouds of dust of his feet. It seemed interesting that he would kind of move on to this 
seemingly different topic, but it's really related. When we see the whole picture here, when he was talking about how he gets vengeance, how he is a jealous God, how he is great in power, how he will not acquit the wicked. Now he goes on to really kind of expand more about his power, if you will. Mm -hmm. so when we consider the great power of God, we are really all the causes to fear that we have sinned against such a God. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he, the message here is to the Ninevites that I am a great and almighty and powerful God who sinned against me. But now judgment is coming. Right. The Lord has a way in the world in the storm. No hurricanes, tornadoes, storms. They're all of God, aren't they? Amen. He sends them as he wishes. In fact, Matthew 5 45 says he causes the rain to be upon the just and the unjust. And he, I think he says he sends the rain on the just and the unjust and causes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. Well, certainly, if God controls the sun and the rain, he controls the storms and the winds. Amen. Back to over in Mark chapter 4, we won't turn there for time's sake. Verses 36 through 41 are the whole account. The disciples and Christ were on a ship and a storm came up. I think Christ was sleeping. He wasn't too worried about it, was he? But the disciples said, As for perish, now that we perish. Mm -hmm. Then he got up and said, Oh, you little faith, and he rebuked the wind and the sea. And it was calm, and they marveled, it says. So what manner of man is this that the winds and the sea, sea obey him? Mm -hmm. Well, everything is under the power of God from the winds and the seas, the storms, and the. Yeah. There's tornadoes or hurricanes, even, which man yeah. flees in fear of. Mm -hmm. A man looks at the radar and predicts where it's going to go, but God sends it where he wants to go. Amen. In fact, that has his way, kind of implies that, that he sends it on the path that he wants to. The clouds are the dust of his feet. We're even the clouds are under his control, aren't they? Verse 4 says, He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. We see this, as we mentioned, there on the Egyptians across, or excuse me, the Israelites had crossed over in Exodus chapter 14. Well, he, he rebuked the sea and made the dry, didn't he? Amen. He just said, well, I think it says he sent a strong east wind there. That was of God. He sent the wind. Amen. Part of the Red Sea, it was as dry ground. He still has the power to do the same today. He says he made. Or he dries up all the rivers. We see that multiple times. And one example is in Joshua chapter 3 when the Israelites were there to cross the Jordan. Right. We have the priest stand there with the Ark of the Covenant at the banks. Mm -hmm. They all crossed over on dry ground. There in Elijah, Elisha, they went up to the Jordan and Elijah spoke the water with his mantle. And so they went across on dry ground. And then again, Elisha did the same thing. After Elijah was caught up, because God was able to take the sea and the rivers and dry it up. Mm -hmm. If he was so pleased, he could part the covenant over here, we could walk across on dry ground. Okay. One day he'll dry it all up, though. Mm -hmm. Like Revelation 21, verse 1 tells us that he'll make a new heaven and a new earth wherein there is no sea. Mm -hmm. I don't quite understand how it's going to look, but he said there'll be no sea there. Mm -hmm. There will be a river of life flowing. He said in the last part of verse 4, Bashan languisheth in Carmel and the flower of Lebanon, <coughs> or Lebanon languisheth. It's Lebanon in Tennessee, it's Lebanon over in the Middle East. <laughs> <coughs> but all these places were flourishing places. Bashan means fruitful. It was known for its fertile land. Carmel means a garden land. Lebanon was known for their cedar trees. They were world renowned. I think even Solomon brought right. them in for the temple. 
He says these places, they languish. They, they're weak, they're dried up. Without the provision of God, all these mighty places are nothing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, America will dry up without the provision of God. That's right. The greatest of people and the greatest of nations, the greatest of cities, whatever it may be, will be as nothing without the provision of God. And that's what I think he is pointing out here. That all things are under his control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there might be great mighty places in this world, but they're nothing without God. Just as Nineveh, they were the great, great mighty city. The Assyrian Empire was a powerful empire. But without God's hand of protection, if He will, over them, they were but nothing. Amen. They would be weak and dried up. Let's go on to verse 5. So the mountains quake at Him, and the hills melt. The earth is burned at His presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. I believe if God were to reveal His full glory, this whole place would just be consumed in a fire. You're right. In fact, let's turn back to Exodus real quick before we close. Exodus 19. Here God just kind of shows just a little bit of His glory. And it almost starts to happen already. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 18. So then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount. This was Mount Sinai. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the other part of the mount. And mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Amen. And the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Amen. It goes on to say, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. God came down, really clothed his glory, if you will, covered it with a cloud, it says here. And just even in that, it says the mountain quaked greatly, there was smoke upon it, and as a smoke of a furnace. Can you imagine what it would be like if God in all his glory would come down? Like I said, I think it would just consume it all. Amen. We won't turn there, but you can go read Psalms 104, verse 32. David really professes the same thing. We will turn to 2 Peter real quick. Because one day it will do exactly what Nahum says here. Right. The earth will be burned in his presence, and gave the world and all that dwell therein. Second Peter, I'm sure we've all heard these scriptures before, but Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Right. One day God's coming back and it's going to all be destroyed. Mm -hmm. It says here, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So all the stuff we spend all our lives laboring after, it's going to be gone. You got it. it As the saying goes, only what's done for Christ will last. I think, it's in my opinion, I haven't studied out enough to point you to a particular scripture other than what we've looked at this morning. But I think if God were to reveal His full glory, I think that's what He'll do here on this day of the Lord that Peter is talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was all burned up, all that's tainted by wickedness, the world, the heavens, the, mm -hmm. all of creation, all the wicked men of the earth. I think it'll just be burned up, as it says here, in a moment. Really, none can stand in the presence of God except they be accepted in Christ. That's to the lead us to verse 6. We're not going to expound upon it, but just read it for our thoughts. It says, Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Mm -hmm. But really, who can stand before God? No one can know themselves. You can only stand before God in the person of the Lord, <clears throat> in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Let's go ahead and close with that, though. Thank you for your time. Yeah.